My father was a staff sergeant, a medic, so I wasn't going to be the one to break that chain. I would have a front row seat watching history unfold. I wanted to see what would happen when I got in combat. You know, would I pee my pants? Would I run the other way? Would I run with the troops toward the bang bang? So I went down to Scranton and raised my right hand and went to Fort Dix for basic training. I was given this magic press card, which it was remarkable in that it gave me the ability to travel all over Vietnam endlessly. I thought maybe when I started to go out in the field with the infantry, that there would be some resentment because I didn't have to be there. I had chosen to be there. It was just the opposite. It was, man, are you out of your mind? You didn't have to be here. Why are you with us? I said, I think what you're doing is important. I want to document it. I called it the first and last rock and roll war. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you, know, you got it. They had long hair and beards, and they wore headbands and anti-war armbands. And once we, we went on a, on a combat assault, and all of a sudden the, the pilot got ready. I could see he was gonna dive. And when the guy dove and planned to splatter the enemy, happiness as a warm gun was blaring through our earphones. And that was just the weirdness of it. There were pallets of Budweiser being flown all over the country. Helicopter pilots would bring along big blocks of ice, and they were trading ice-cold beer for war trophies. The AK-47 was coveted. The troops got to roll the beer cans on the ice and have, you know, ice-cold beer in the middle of Cambodia where it's 110 degrees. Here's a shot where, um, where we were being attacked. And here are the guys reloading because they know they're coming again. This guy's smoking a cigarette and drinking a Budweiser, which Vietnam is the only war you would have seen that. You can use the camera as a shield. I used it as a shield in Vietnam, a lot of people have. And I wanted to show the true horror of war, so I decided to do something which at the time seemed to make sense. I decided for a month or two to fly nothing but dust off, nothing but medevacs, because every day you saw the results of war, dead and horribly wounded. It later turned out that it was devastating. This one is the one that later on really got me. You can't see it much because he had stepped on a mine and was cut in half. There's nothing from the uh, waist on down. And um, the door gunners said, um, you know, we're gonna clean out the slick, what they were calling hamburger, if it was all in it and it was all over me. They said, they want us to hose you down, and, and they did. And what's weird about that experience that day, I flew back into Saigon, went to the hotel, and had my cognac and soda, and it didn't affect me. It wasn't registering. And that was the numbness I felt in Vietnam. There's something called dissociation. When you disassociate, you, you forget big chunks of what went on. Or you remember it, but it's like happening to someone else. 40 years later, it affected me to a degree that was Horrific. The Vietnam Photo Book was the first book and one of the only books published by somebody who was in the Army. New York Times, they put a full page ad that said, Smile, you're in Vietnam, and then it started getting glowing reviews. And after the Vietnam Photo Book and everything else, I had a career full-blown career as a photojournalist. I remember um, Doc Klein, our family doctor, said to me, something happened to you in Vietnam, you're a different person. I said, yeah, Doc, you know, I got to experience combat, I got to have a front row to history, and I got a career. He said, no, no, Mark, I'm meaning something bad. Something bad happened to you. Jesus, did you hear? Jesus! Okay, that's why I'm back in f***ing Vietnam and Cambodia. <laughs> like
like what you see? Help VIA tell more of your stories with a donation today. Become a member at wvia.org support.